You know, I believe that God has given us a church, a, as a church, as a congregation, over these past uh, several weeks, a, a word that's been in due season. We're in week seven of our breakthrough series, and uh, it was intended to be probably a four-week series, but God just kept on speaking, and, uh, and here we are on week seven, and we may even go further. And uh, I believe that it's a season that God is bringing us into, and I believe that he's, it's been a strategic word that God has placed on, on my heart for you as a congregation as we enter into 2020. I believe that 2020 for many of us is going to mark a, a time of new beginnings, a, a season of breakthrough. I believe that right now as a church, as a congregation, and as we enter into 2020, I believe that this is a season of breakthrough. This is why God is releasing the word that he's releasing right now. I believe there's some things in our lives that we're going to overcome, some things in our lives that we are going to see and, and walk in a level of victory because of God's word. If we will carefully listen to what God is saying, if you have to, go back and listen to the, the, the past messages starting from week one and, and, just, and just get it into your heart because I believe that, that God is, is releasing just the victory into our lives and walking in a level of victory that you and I may have never walked in before. The Bible says that we are to move from glory to glory to faith to faith. The Bible says that the, the pathway of the righteous grows brighter and brighter and brighter into the noonday sun. I believe that God wants to, to bring, bring blessing. He wants to bring victory. He wants to, tomorrow to look better than it did today. He wants us to build upon what he's done in our life yesterday and build upon it today. And move to the next level in our relationship with him and, and, and get a greater revelation of his love, a greater revelation of his grace, a greater revelation of his power in our lives. Amen? Amen. And I believe that God is strategically speaking to us here in 2019 and is setting us up for something big in 2020. And I'm looking forward to what God is doing. I mean, we've got, we're wrapping up this year, and we're going into the beginning of the year, 21 days of fasting. And, a, and then after that, just a couple weeks after that's done, we've got, we've got a week of revival meetings coming with Jonathan Shuttlesworth. And I believe that God is doing something. God is preparing us. He's preparing our hearts right now for what he has for us in the new year. And I think it's important for us to recognize what he's doing and hear the word that God is speaking to us and act on it. You know, the Bible says to be doers of the word, not only hearers. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Because when you just hear the word, it says, you're just deceiving yourself. But be doers and grab a hold of what God is saying and walk it out in our lives to see what God wants to do through us and in us. And I believe that right now we're positioning ourselves and God is positioning us to see the breakthrough that we need in our lives. For some of us, it's the breakthrough that we need in our, in our marriage. You know, it's just that, that we feel like there's this, this wall that we keep on hitting or in our finances. We just can't get to the next level that we need to get to and to, to see what and to, to, to accomplish and do what God wants us to do. Maybe Maybe it's in our career. It's just we keep on bumping up against this wall. Where am I going? I just don't feel like I'm fulfilling what God wants me to do. I know there's more on the other side of this barrier that I'm facing. It might be another area. It might be emotionally. It might be mentally. It might be, it might be spiritually. It just seems like there's this wall, this barrier that I need to break through to, to, to walk into all that God wants me into a deeper relationship with him. And, and right now, maybe you're here today and you feel spiritually frustrated in that way. But I'm here today to tell you that God wants to bring breakthrough in your life. He wants to bring you to the next level. And I believe that the word that's been released over these past few weeks, over these several weeks, over these seven weeks here, that I believe that God is bringing a word to see you walk in victory and walk to the next level that he has for you in your life. Where you are today is not where you're going. God has greater plans. He has a purpose and a plan for every single person here today. He has, a, he has a purpose. He's designed you specifically with a purpose and a design that he's given nobody else. He's he shaped you in your mother's womb, and he, and he, and he, and he designed you to, to walk out a plan, to, to, to contribute to the kingdom of God, to contribute to this world and to make it a better place, to contribute to the work of Jesus Christ and be a, a vessel of what God wants to do here on the earth. 
And I believe that God's going to bring us to the next level here. I don't, know about, um, I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of the devil interfering with my family. I'm, devil, I'm sick and tired of the devil interfering with my body. I'm sick and tired of the devil interfering with my finances. I'm, di- I'm sick and tired of the devil interfering with my purpose. I'm sick and tired of seeing the devil. He seems to, he, it just seems like he, he, he's, he's influencing things, and, and it seems like the battles are being lost, but they really aren't. When we realize what Jesus has done on the cross, that the battle is won, and we need to recognize and know what Jesus has already done. I believe God, God's, God's purpose and God's plan and God's intent for us is to have peace in every area of our life. Wholeness. We serve a holistic God. He's concerned about your emotions. He's concerned about your mind, your, your mental health. He's, he's concerned about your, your physical health, your spiritual health. He's concerned about your finances. He's concerned about your career path. He's not worrying about it. He's got a plan, and he's got provision for it. He already has it. I think, I've, you know, the, the Bible teaches us that everything, <laughs> God has already done it all for us. But what we have to do is that we have to position ourselves in order to receive what he's already done. And it's all about God's word. It's like week one, we talked about whose report will you, well, whose report will you believe? It's about relieving what the word of God says and, and, and trusting in God's word over everything else. Trusting God's word over our feelings, over our emotions, what the circumstances around us might speak. It's believing God's word over anything else. It doesn't matter about what they experience or what they're experiencing, what he's experiencing, what she's experiencing, or even what I have experienced. The word of God is not based upon our personal experiences. It's based on the word of God himself. It's not changing. It's never changing. The Bible says, I am the Lord and I change not. The Bible says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. And he does not change who he is based on how we feel or what we've gone through in the past. He is faithful. He is faithful. He's able to do the the miraculous in your life. He's able to bring you through every situation that you're facing. I I say so much to you, but, but the Bible says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We walk through it. We don't stay there. We don't build a campfire. We don't set up a tent. We we walk through. We go through. And it says his his rod and his staff, he comforts us with it. He's there right with us, bringing us through. And victory is his plan. Victory is his purpose. Victory is what he wants to bring into our lives. And it's all about the word. I want to share this, this saying with you and maybe... It'll help some of you, but if you work the word, the word will work. (laughs) If you work the word, the word will work. It's not just a bunch of neat sayings and motivational scriptures. It's, it's, It's the living, breathing word of God. It's, it's inspired, was inspired, and holy men wrote it, and the Holy Spirit inspired this. It's God breathed. And there's a time when we have to say in our lives, in our spiritual lives, that enough is enough. Enough is enough. I'm I'm, I'm tired of of feeling defeated. I'm tired of being put down. I'm tired of not living in the destiny and the purpose that God has called me to be. be. And we've got to come to a place and we realize and we see what the Bible tells us, that the devil is under our feet. He's under our feet. The plan for our lives as believers are to be overcomers. Jesus Christ has overcome the world. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the enemy. Every work of the enemy in your life, Jesus has come to destroy, whether it's sickness, poverty, maybe it's mental health, that you've been tormented by depression and, and, and anxious feelings. Maybe, maybe, it's your fina- maybe it's lack and poverty. He came to destroy everything that is not of God. God does not have poverty to give you. God does not have sickness to give you. He does not have sin to to, 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 to give you. He does not have addiction to give you. Everything, Everything that has come because of the curse, Jesus has come to destroy. And we can walk in victory in those ways, in those places. He's made provision for it in his word. 
But today what I want to talk to you about, you know, about today what I want to talk to you about is the breakthrough. It's a, it's a very important thing that we need to, to see breakthrough in in many of our lives is financial breakthrough. It's breakthrough and seeing God's provision. I want to talk to you today about God's keys to supernatural provision. There's times in our life when we need the provision of God, isn't there? There's times when we face impossible situations. There's times in our lives when we need to see God come through in our situation. It might not be because you're experiencing poverty in your life, but maybe God's calling you to something greater. But, but you, you, you just don't have the, the provision to move forward and do what God has called you to do. Have you ever been there? Yeah. We've all been in a place where we've needed God's provision. We've needed his, his miracle working power. But this is where people tense up when they hear about. But God wants to release provision into your life. And God has laid out in Scripture his plan, his purpose to bring provision. He's, he, he, the, it says that he's Jehovah Jireh, our provider, the God that supplies all of our needs. I believe that God doesn't intend for us to have lack in any area of our lives. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But the Bible says that Jesus came. He said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly in every area of your life. He is a holistic God. He, just, he, 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 he bought our, our salvation on the cross, but he gave us so much more. There's so much in the cross. And he wants us to live out this, this life in victory and in purpose. But if we'll work the word, the word will work. Today I want to talk about two stories. Real, I want to go through these two stories that give us a, a picture, a small picture of what God, how God operates and how, how, how we can see God's plan for provision for us. I want to talk about first about Elijah the prophet. And then I want to talk about his, 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 um, his protege, Elisha. Elijah was a mighty prophet. Many people, they just probably one of the most revered prophets in the Bible. They, 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 they think of Elijah, you think about great things like his mighty standoff of the 400 prophets of Baal, where they had a contest where, where with the God that, that can call down fire onto this burnt offering, that's, that is the God. That is the real God. The prophets of Baal, they, 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 they built an altar. They, built, they, they put a, a sacrifice on the altar, and they, and they danced around the altar, and they were calling to their God them. So your, your God must be asleep. Your God must be, oh, we must be busy right now. Your, your, your God must be on vacation or something. Their God did not answer with fire. But Elijah, he built a, 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 an altar. He, put, he laid the sacrifice on the altar and he told them, bring water and douse it with water. Douse it with more water. And he called to the God. To his God, the God of Elijah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God came and he consumed the, the sacrifice. And it was a, a miraculous thing. And it showed that, the, that, that God, the God of Israel, was a true and living God. But God used Elijah in many ways. Elijah was tormented by this lady, this, 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 uh, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Jezebel was a, was a, a deceiving lady who was, who was immoral and she was deceiving. And, 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 and tried to bring torment and fear and confusion into, into Elijah's life. Sometimes Elijah would be found running away from this lady and in the works that she had and how she came against his ministry. They were, they were worshipers of Baal. They set up these, these altars to Baal and statues to Baal. And because of their, their worship to Baal in Israel, the, uh, Elijah commanded that there be no rain and that there would be a drought, there would be a famine in the land. So God sent Elijah to the brook Cherith and said, you'll be provided for here. Here you'll have water. Here you'll have, wa here you'll have food. Here, two times a day, a raven will bring you food to eat. So he stayed there, and he, and he, and he enjoyed the, the, the nourishment from God, the provision of God. And then, the, the, and then the, the brook dried up during this famine, and God said, go. There's a lady. You're going to find your provision there. And I want to read you this. I want to read to you this story from 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16 about Elijah finding his provision. It was not only his provision, but because of his provision, he was able to provide for somebody else. You know, we are blessed to be a blessing. Did you know that? 
God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the world around you. I want to read to you what, what, this story from the book of Kings, 1 Kings 17, 8, 8 through 16. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the city gate, indeed, a widow was gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may, we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as I have said. But make me a small cake from it first. It seems a little selfish, but God was doing something here. And bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and she and he and and her household ate for many days, and the bin of flour was not used up, nor the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. I believe that God has a word for us today, and I, and I believe that the key to the widow's provision wasn't really about what she kept, but it was what she gave away. It was about what she had. It wasn't about what, see, in America, what, we, what we're conditioned and what we, what we con conditioned to in the natural is to get all we can, can all we get, and sit on the lid. And that's how we think that we get ahead. But God has a plan for his children. You know, kingdom economics are different than the economics of this world. I think budgeting is great. I think investing is great. I think all of that is great, and we should do it. But in kingdom economics... God shows us a key here to our provision and to our blessing. It's not about what we keep. It's not about what we have, but it's about what we give. And as children of God, we need to recognize the source of our provision. God has revealed himself to us as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He says, I will supply all of your needs. I want to tell you something. God has taken personal responsibility to take care of you. The Bible says, uh, uh, Jesus says, don't worry about anything. Do the birds worry? Do, the, do the, the lilies of the field worry? But no, they have everything that they need. How much more valuable are you? God has placed great value and in your, in your life, and God has a plan, God has a purpose, and God wants to use you to be, he wants to bless you to be a blessing to everybody else. Any amens in this place today? Amen. But I believe, it. you see, we've got to come to the, the, the terms that it's not our, employ, our employer is not our provider, our mom and dad are our provider, our, our trust fund's not our provider, the government's not our provider. That God himself is our provider, and he has laid out in Scripture the means of supernatural provision. As we honor him and obey his word, everything could dry up, but God could still and will supernaturally provide for his children. Does anybody need to hear this message today? <laughs> but we need to understand the principles of kingdom economics. I want to read to you about Elisha now. Elisha, Elijah was Elisha's mentor. Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion of his anointing when he left the earth. Elijah said, well, if you will see me when I leave, you will receive my mantle. You will receive the double portion of what God, the anointing that God has placed upon my life. So Elisha followed him everywhere. He learned from him. He was a student of his. He, 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 he just was so hungry and just wanted the anointing of God upon his life. And when Elijah left and went into heaven, because of the whirlwind of the, the fiery chariot, chariot brought him to heaven. 
The mantle fell from heaven upon Elisha, and he received double the anointing, the double portion of the anointing upon, that was upon Elijah's life. And what we see in Elisha's life, we saw twice as many miracles performed in Elisha's life than, than was in Elijah's life. God used Elisha in, in miraculous ways. God, God also used Elisha in a way to bring provision to people's life. God, God saw lack in people's lives and was eager to bring a, 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 a solution, a supernatural provision into their lives. We're going to read quickly from 2 Kings 4, and we're going to read 1 through 2. We're actually going to read through this story that we find in the Bible, actually through verse 7. In 2 Kings 4, 1 through 2, it says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditors are coming to take my two sons to be their slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. We don't know this lady's name. We don't know her husband's name. But Jewish tradition tells us that it was the prophet Obadiah. Obadiah was a, was a great prophet in the Bible. He wrote the book of Obadiah. And Obadiah was a, a man of God, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he, was, he was known for taking care of other prophets. And in fact, he was, because prophets were often persecuted and on the run, he hid and provided for 50 prophets. He had a great responsibility to train these prophets and hide them and help them release them into the work of the Lord. And it was not uncommon for prophets to be on the run and, and, and on the run for people who didn't like the message that they were preaching and they, and they, didn't, they didn't appreciate the, the message from the Lord when God would bring correction or encouragement or direction to the kingdom or to the people. And they would get upset and they would chase them. And oftentimes, because of this persecution, they found themselves in tough places. Oftentimes, when, in, in, in that culture of the time, that when they found themselves in, a, in, a, in debt and they couldn't pay it off, it was common for, them to, for the creditors to take the sons and bring them into slavery. And she was horrified by this fact that she had no means to keep her sons from leaving her home and go into slavery. It totally horrified her, that, but she was in a hopeless situation. With no means. And in that culture of the time, this lady was unemployable. She couldn't make enough money or, or work in a way that could, cut, that could supply her means or to, to pay the bills or even pay her creditors. It was a hopeless situation. Have you ever been in a hopeless situation? Have you really had it bad? <laughs> I want to tell you that God wants to provide. And God does miracles in our lives. So this grieving widow lost her husband. The bills are piling up, not employable. And humanly speaking, she was basically in a hopeless situation. We think some of the situations that we get into are bad, like our GPS took us to the wrong place, or, or we go through drive through and they mess up our order, or we walked into our closet. It's full of clothes, and we say, I've got nothing to wear. You know what I mean? But this lady was, was facing a hopeless situation. They're going to take my two boys. My marriage is over. My, my, my husband is dead. I'm going to have to claim bankruptcy. And maybe today you're facing an impossible situation. Maybe you're, you're facing a situation where, God, I need you to come through. It might be in your body. It might be in your health. It might be in your career. It might be uh, in, the, in the job search. It might be in your finances. It might be in your marriage. It might be that, that, that lost son and daughter who's wandered away from the faith. And, and you're, just, you're just asking God to bring them home. There's moments in our lives when we face things that are seemingly impossible. But I want to tell you today, there's nothing that is, in, that is too impossible. There's nothing impossible for our Lord. There's, there's nothing too hard for him. No matter what situation that you're going through, no matter what barrier or obstacle you're facing, our God is able to break through those walls. God is able to give us the answer. Our God is able to do what no man, no woman, that, that we can't even do for ourselves and bring the answer to bring the provision into our lives. 
as we honor him, as we obey him, as we walk the walk of faith, trusting in his word, trusting that our God is our provider, our God is a miracle worker, our God is our healer, our God is our restorer, our God wants to see good things in our life. He's not waiting to catch us mess up all the time. He's not there to beat us down with a stick, but we serve a good God. You may be in need of God's supernatural provision. Maybe it's paying off debt. Maybe it's maybe it's living. Maybe right now you're finding yourself you're living in lack, and now you don't have enough uh, enough to, to get you by for this more month than there is money right now. And you find yourself in need, or maybe you've got a God given dream, and you and, and and you just don't know how it's going to get accomplished. You don't just don't know how you're going to take those next next steps. You just realize that there needs to be some kind of provision for me to 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 do what God has called me to do. And you're experiencing that that wall that you need breakthrough in. That wall of not enough. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's that wall that, that of seemingly, it seems like the wall of lack in our lives. We just don't know how to get over or break through it. Thank God we, think of, we have a God that thinks of everything, though. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. Sin, sickness, poverty, lack. Every area of our life, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. I believe that there's provision for all of that found in the cross. I believe that what Jesus did has paid the price for us to walk in victory in every area of our life. It's not something that we just automatically walk in, but it's something that we pursue. It's something that we we contend for. We contend for it in our life. Everything that we receive in the kingdom of God is received by faith. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as we read God's word, we trust God's word, we speak God's word, we think about God's word, we talk about God's word, we meditate on God's word. Like it says in Joshua 1 verse 8, it says that he will make you prosper. He will make you prosper. As we live according to his commands, as we live according to the word of God, and and we trust and have faith in his promises. And I believe that God has a holistic approach to how he he sees us and how he has redeemed us, but we tend to compartmentalize him. Okay, Jesus, he's my savior. He is, and that's the best part about this. He has saved you from your sins. But he's redeemed you from the curse of the law, the Bible says. He's redeemed you from everything that the devil brought in in the Garden of Eden. You see, mankind, we walked in the Garden of Eden. We walked in peace. We walked in wholeness. God said he gave us dominion in this earth. And when man fell, when, 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 man, when, when man took that bite of that, of, that, of that fruit and sin and fell, there's a legal transaction that happened where... That dominion was transferred to the devil. That's what the Bible calls the devil. The, 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 the prince and the power of the air calls him the, 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 the God of this world, little G. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy, and he's given you and I authority here on the earth, restoring us to the, his original intent, intent. For us to have victory, for us to have wholeness and peace in every area of our life, we serve a holistic God. It gives him no pleasure to see you suffer. It gives him no pleasure for you to be sick. It gives him no pleasure to see you struggling financially. We have to realize that we we serve a, a good God. A good God who loves us. First John, actually third John, verse two, it's only got one chapter in it. It says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Jesus came to earth, he died on the cross, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. And he bought and purchased our victory as believers. 
Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. He's concerned about your soul health. About what he's doing on the inside and what he's doing on the inside will come out on the outside and manifest itself. He'll, he, he's concerned about our, our heart. He's concerned about our walk with him. He's concerned about getting the word of God inside of us and, and let it be a part of our thoughts and our breathing and, and living it out and being doers of the word and not just hearers. And understanding and knowing God's principles of provision. Everything that we access in the kingdom of God, we access by faith. To walk in the blessing God has shown us in scripture. He also shows us how to position ourselves in order to be blessed and position ourselves to receive the supernatural provision that God wants to see in our life. We talk about receiving healing or receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or receiving salvation, and anything else that God has done and, and promised us in Scripture, in the same way, when we are in need, when we're needing provision, God has laid out also how to position ourselves to receive in that area as well. You're hearing me today. So I want to give you some principles. First of all, what you need the most is what often you have to give away. Need friends? Be friendly. <laughs> you need help? Give help. You need favor? Show favor. You need provision? Be generous. Take what you have and be a blessing to somebody else, no matter what it is. What is the area of need that you have in your life? Do you need a friend? Do you need friends? Be friendly. Give what you have and be a blessing to somebody else. The Bible teaches a principle that's laid out very clearly called seed time and harvest. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will remain. And it's a principle that is used throughout scripture that God shows us. It's not only a scripture, but it's a lifestyle that God intends for us to live by and to live in. So how does Elijah, Elijah respond to this lady? Did he respond and say, it's not my problem, good luck to you, you know, I hope that everything works out for you? <laughs> Let's see what he says in verse 2, it says again, it says, so Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in, in the house but a jar of oil. She didn't have a husband or wife. She didn't really didn't have any money. She wasn't even scraping by. This lady was having it tough. Maybe today you don't have a husband or wife. Maybe today you don't have enough money. Maybe today you feel like you're scraping by. Maybe today you are, you're, like I said before, you're walking in the closet. Maybe you don't have anything to wear. It might seem like there's more month left to more money left more more month left than there is money. Maybe, but maybe it might seem like there's enough for you to survive and to pay the bills, but not enough to do what God has called you to do, to move to the next level in your business, in your career, in the ministry that God has called you into. You see, here's a key to financial breakthrough. The key. The financial provision, supernatural provision, is in your seed. The key to your breakthrough of your need is in your seed. What has God given you? God can only multiply what is given. With an open hand, we can give, and with an open hand, we can receive. But with a closed fist, we can neither give or receive. God responds to an open hand. And anything that we give to him, he will bless. God, the way that God works to provide for our needs, he, he, he's looking for the seed and how we release the seed in our life. What we do for others, he will do for us. The seed that we sow will come back as a harvest. So Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? And he said, your maidservant has nothing in that house but a jar of oil. 
Oil at the time was valuable. It was not only used for cooking and burning lamps and medicine and moisturizers. It was like their bath and body works, you know what I mean, to keep their skin nice and soft. <laughs> it made leather, made leather pliable and, and, and soft and able to work, and they, it kept iron from rusting. They used it to anoint, and they even, they even used it as an offering to God at some times. It was very valuable. It was an essential part of life. But I'm so thankful that we have a God who provides. In Hebrew, there's this word El Shaddai. It means the God of more than enough. We serve El Shaddai, not El Chipo. <laughs> El Shaddai means a God of more than enough. He's just not, he's not trying to see how little you can get by with. He's not trying to see how much you can just barely scrape by and struggle to survive. It doesn't give him good pleasure to see you in pain and struggle. <laughs> there are times when we have it rough. There's times when we go through seasons like that. But ultimately, I believe that it's God's will to see your, to see your needs met, to see you being able to walk out his provision, to walk out his, his, his purpose and plan for your life. With the seed and what we give him, he will multiply. And I want to make you this promise to you that you cannot... You will not, you never can outgive God. Amen. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 says, But I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. This is talking about finances here in this scripture. That is the context in giving. But I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully or generously will also reap bountifully. So let each one, as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that having all, you, all sufficiency. This is the word. This is the word. All sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God wants to bless you to be a blessing so that you can be but a blessing in every good work. <laughs> God wants to use you to pay somebody's grocery bill. Somebody wants to use, God wants to use you to make sure those kids who are going to, going to, going to school next year have, have clothes to go to school. God wants to use you to send missionaries around the world. God wants to use you. What if you saw a need <laughs> that nobody else could fulfill, but because God blessed you, you're able to meet that need? I believe that that is God's will for us as believers, to, to give us everything we need for every good work, all sufficiency in all things. What does all mean? All may have an abundance for every good work. We think about, we, and look at the boy who brought the two loaves and two fish, the, the five loaves and two fish. We read about this story. People were, were gathered to, to hear Jesus preach, and they were, they were gathered there, and they're hearing Jesus all day. And the disciples said, hey, hey, Jesus, I think it's time to, time to quit here. The people are getting hungry. Let's go, let's send them into the town so they get something to eat before it gets dark. Jesus said, I'm not sending them away. Why don't you feed them? They said, how can we feed these people? We've got nothing here. All there is is this little boy with five loaves and two fish. That's all we got. What's that going to do? No one, people just have this tiny, tiny crumb, if that. There are 5,000 people there. They're counting only men. So that, that tells me there are 15, maybe even up to 30,000 people there. And Jesus said, no, you feed them. <laughs> Bring me that boy. Bring me what this boy has in his basket. He's the only one here that came, that came prepared. <laughs> this little boy. <laughs> I like this little boy. Come here. So give it to me. And Jesus took it. It was a seed. The boy had a seed. What do you have in your hand to give to Jesus? A seed. And Jesus lifted up and he blessed it. And from that point on, as food was grabbed out of the baskets, it was multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. 
and multiply and multiply. Everything you give to Jesus is blessed. And everything that Jesus blesses multiplies. <laughs> and it says all those people, it didn't say that they, they, they ate enough to take the edge off until they could make it back to their house. Everybody ate until they were full. And then there were baskets left over. What you give to Jesus is blessed. And what you give to whatever is blessed by Jesus multiplies. And it all started with a seed. It all started with somebody recognized, what do I have? And how can God use me in this situation? How can God use me with what he's provided me with? Luke 6, 38 says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. That was like getting this, this basket and it was all overflowed. They had to shake it up and, and pat it, press it down and put more in there. It wasn't just because when, when things are fluffy and you put, you put straw or you put wheat or you put grain or whatever in there, it's, it's, it's fluffy until you, you shake it down and you, you press it down. He said, give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. <laughs> There's an element that many churches fail to teach their churches. I think budgeting is essential. Most churches teach that. I think proper stewardship is essential. Most churches teach that. But they fail to teach how to receive supernatural provision from the Lord. They're teaching us what we can do. I'm teaching you what God can do. The key to your supernatural provision is in the seed, the system that God has put in place. It's a spiritual law of seed time and harvest. In Genesis 8.22, as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall remain. And we see this principle in, 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 in place in other areas of our life. We sow friendliness, we, re we reap the harvest of friendship. We sow kindness, we reap the harvest of kindness. We, we, sow, we sow helpfulness, we receive the harvest of help. We sow seeds of unfriendliness, and people are unfriendly to you. We, we sow seeds of stinginess, and people are, not, people are stingy towards us. We sow seeds of judgment, <laughs> and our harvest is judgment. See, when we judge people, we, all of a sudden we set ourselves, we set a new standard for ourselves to live by. <laughs> That's seed time and harvest. We sow seeds of judgment. All of a sudden, our harvest is judgment. We set a new standard for ourselves to live by. The question is, what does God put in your hand? Often to the key, the key to our miracle is in our hands. It's what God has already given us. With Moses, what was in Moses' hand? It was a staff. And God used that staff to, 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 help, to help bring the children of Israel out of Egypt from the hand of Pharaoh. And I want to tell you today that, that, that what we need to do is we need to stop waiting for what we want and start sowing what we have. We're always waiting for God to do something when he's told us to do it to do something, to position ourselves to receive the blessing that he has promised us to receive. Here's another principle. Give God what you have and trust him to give you what you need. Let's go to verse 3. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all of your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you, come, and when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour, in, pour into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. 
So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass that when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And, and he said, there are no more vessels. There's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God and said, go sell, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons shall live on the rest. As long as she had an empty jar, God would fill it. <laughs> so much blessing that they could not contain it. If they had more vessels, it would, have kept, it would have kept on coming. And this reminds me of the tithe, the promise of the tithe in the Bible. When Malachi 3.10 says, it, it says, bring all the tithes in the storehouse so there may be food in my house. He says, test me in this. If I will not pour out such blessing in your life, that you will not be able to contain it. <laughs> when it comes to finances, Christians have a hard time. Some Christians have a hard time. Stepping out in faith and believing God. We have faith for salvation. We have faith for healing. But faith in our finances, well, I got that under control. <laughs> I got that under control. My Excel spreadsheet tells me everything. <laughs> There's sometimes God's going to ask you to do something with your finances that does not make sense in the natural. Giving always activates God's blessing. Giving always activates favor. It opens the windows of heaven. It activates favor in your life. It, it activates favor and blessing into, in, into your finances, into your job, into your family. The Bible says that even when we tithe, that, that he rebukes the devourer for our sake. God's protection and blessing is upon us. I cannot afford not to tithe. I can't afford to give above and beyond offerings in my life. I've seen God's faithfulness over and over and over again when there are times when it didn't make sense financially, when there's nothing to show for. I gave and saw God's faithfulness and blessing in my life over and over and over. God's economy is different than the world's economy. It's an upside down economy. The more you give, the more he, he supplies. The more you give, the more he blesses. Proverbs 11.24 says this, give freely and become more wealthy. You want a you wealth plan? We're talking about kingdom economics here. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. <laughs> That doesn't make sense. I cannot calculate that on my Excel spreadsheet. I cannot, I cannot discuss this with my accountant. He doesn't understand. <laughs> There's been times in my life when God told me to give everything that I had, and I did. <laughs> That's faith, but sometimes it can be a little bit like, well, I don't, okay, God. I'm trusting you with this. But God has always provided. God has always come through. And I've seen, the, I've seen God's blessing. I've seen his faithfulness. In this Christmas season, we have an opportunity to give. We, we buy gifts for our families. We, we bless them and we celebrate this awesome gift that we have in Jesus Christ, the salvation of our sins, uh, the redemption of mankind. God himself said that, said that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his first and his best so that we could all be blessed. He gave a seed. He sowed a seed and reaped a harvest. Jesus was the seed. If that seed was never sown, there would not be a harvest. God works by seed time and harvest in this world. If that seed was not cast down to the ground... The harvest of souls, you and I, and the many to come, <laughs> would not be possible. I'm going to have the worship team come forward. We're going to wrap things up today. But as we approach the end of the year, I believe God is preparing us for great things in 2020, a great harvest. But I believe that in order to receive this harvest, we've got to be obedient and release the seed 
release the seed. I, we're, I believe that this is a season of breakthrough for our church. I believe it's a season of breakthrough through up, up the, this last end of the year and through 2020. We're going to be, begin to see God do great things in our lives. And often to be a part of what God is doing, we've got to release a seed into what he is doing. I believe that God is releasing blessing. I believe that he's, he, he's releasing favor into our lives, into our church. And I believe that he's asking us today, today to, to, to sow a seed into the kingdom. Provision comes by what you release, not what you keep. God can't multiply what you keep in your hand. When we give it to Jesus, he blesses it, and it's able to be multiplied. The offering is what we give above and beyond what our tithe is. It's what we give to God as an act of worship. The tithe is, opens up the windows of blessing so that our seed can be multiplied. And even in the book of, the book of Malachi, it said, in, in some translations, it says that you've, you've robbed me the tithes and the offerings. But it's a seed, and, God, and the, the offering, the offering is an act of worship to him. But it's for our benefit. It's a worship, it's worship to him. But God sets up this economy in the kingdom. He sets things up. To provide for his, he sets up principles and laws, and he set to establish the law of seed time and harvest. And this, and this, this, this Christmas season, you see that that offering envelope that you have. I want you to grab it out and wave it at me. I don't want anybody giving anything today. Okay. What I'm asking you to do is pray. Pray about the seed that you will sow into the kingdom. This is our gift to Jesus. See, we, we, we create our Christmas lists, and we, and we, and we prepare um, Christmas gifts for everybody, except for the person that we're celebrating. <laughs> Christmas is about Jesus. I believe our, our greatest, most generous gift should be to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It says when the, the three kings, the three wise men came to see Jesus. People, some people say Jesus was poor, but, but listen. They brought him gold, <laughs> myrrh, <laughs> and frankincense. God supernaturally provided for Jesus. In the same way, I believe that we should give. Join me. I'm going to do the same. Join me in praying and asking God what your best gift is to bring to Jesus. And on December 22, we're going to have an offering, a free will offering. We're not, we're not twisting anybody's arms, but we're going to allow God to speak to you because we want to end this year in strength and in faith because God has an awful lot of good things that he has for us to do come 2020. We already have great things in store. We've got, a, we've got evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Like we keep on talking about, you don't understand, this is big. It's big for our church. And we believe that there's going to be a harvest of souls. God's going to, God's going to bring the, just going to release the, the fire and the passion for evangelism within this church. And we're going to see God move in powerful ways. Already God is setting things up. But today, we are going to pray. Maybe today we're going to pray and, 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 and God's going to give you a number. You can write it on your offering envelope by faith. Maybe it's a faith promise. So this is God speaking to me right now. Whatever we give to Jesus, he blesses. The greatest investment that we can make is into the kingdom of God. Not into your, your retirement is important, but it's not more important than the kingdom of God. <laughs> Some of us are afraid to pray and ask God about this. <laughs> because it means that we have to obey. <laughs> You with me today? Do you know my heart today? If you're with us here for the first time, stick with us for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Just stick with us for the next couple of weeks. God's doing amazing things here. We're seeing the Spirit of God move in powerful ways. And 
And this is what God has laid on my heart for today as we move into 2020. But today, let's pray. Father, today we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for providing it for our needs. Lord, we thank you for the necessities that are met, Lord. We have food on the table, food in our refrigerator. We've got clothes, Lord. We can walk into that closet and see all those clothes and still say, I've got nothing to wear. We thank you, Lord, that you've given it all to us, Lord. You've given us abundance. Father, we thank you, Lord. We, some may have more than others, but Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We're here today. Every day we wake up is a blessing, Lord. <laughs> Every day where there's food on our table, it's a blessing. And Lord, you've given everybody something to give. Today, Lord, I ask you to, to speak to hearts and speak to lives today. Speak to people, Lord. As we make a faith promise towards the end of the year, Lord, for our Christmas offering, what will we give to Jesus? What is our best gift that we can give to Jesus this year? the one that we're celebrating, the one that it's all about. Lord, we want it to be all about you. We want to give you our first. We want to give you our best as an act of worship. Just as the, just as the, the three wise men, they, they knelt down, they presented gifts to you this year, Lord. We come to, we come this, Christian, this Christmas service to present our best gifts to the Lord and the Savior of the world. We thank you, Jesus. Every head bowed, eye closed. If, that's, if today God's speaking to you, I want to give you an opportunity to write that on your envelope. God's speaking to people right now. Hallelujah. But the most important thing to remember is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're here today and you're far from God, you're here today and you've been, you've been struggling, you've been far, you've been walking away, you've been have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Maybe you're here today, you've never made a decision to follow Christ, and today I want to introduce you to the Savior of the world. Today I want to share with you the good news that Jesus Christ, God the Father, saw the lostness of humanity he saw the sin that separates us from having a relationship with God. And he sent his son Jesus. He had you on his mind. He sent Jesus to live a sinless and perfect life. And went to the cross to bear your sins, to bear, to bear your pain, to bear your shame. So that your sins can be forgiven. He paid a price that he didn't owe. You owed the price. He paid a debt that you couldn't pay. So he took all of your sin and he bore it on the cross. And he paid for your sins so that you, if you accept what he did on the cross and you say, you confess him with your mouth, Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that you will be saved. It says in the Bible that, that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And today, if you'll give him your life, you'll give him your heart, you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Make me new. And give me the, the grace and the power to live this life as a follower of Jesus Christ. And maybe right now you're, that's not you, but you are just kind of in a lukewarm state, maybe backsliding state, maybe. And you're saying, Jesus, I want to recommit my life to you. I want to recognize once again what you've done on the cross for me. I honor you for it. Forgive me for where I failed you. I accept forgiveness. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And if you'll do that, he'll forgive you. It doesn't matter how far you are from him right now. It doesn't matter what sin you have committed. It doesn't matter. He's standing there with arms open wide, ready for you to come home. He's ready for you to, to be embraced. He's ready for you to make that commitment. So Father, today, those who have made that choice to follow you, they've recommitted their lives to you in Jesus' name. We ask, Lord, that you give them the strength. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you fill them with your spirit, Lord, 
to live this life out in power and victory in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today, if you made a commitment to follow the Lord, I want you to put just flip over your connection card and then check off on the, on the back that I recommitted my life to Christ or I've given my life to Christ for the first time and drop it in the, in the, in the bucket on your way out. We'd love to be able to get in touch with you and help you and equip you and, and give you some, some material to help you in, um, in, in this walk, this new walk that you have with him. So, Father, today we thank you for your blessing. We thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, Lord, I speak blessing, I speak peace, I speak wholeness over this congregation. That, Lord, as we enter into this Christmas season, Lord, that, Lord, we'd experience a peace that we've never experienced before. We experience your love like we've never experienced before. And we can reflect on all that you've done and be so grateful for God the Father sending his son, Jesus Christ, to come to earth as that little baby and die for us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you. We'd love to see you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. We'd love to see you next Sunday. It's going to be a great, great time as we enter into the Christmas season. But God bless you. We love you. And we hope to see you next week. Amen, amen.